Okay, everyone, uh, thanks for coming. We're gonna get started. Uh, I'm feeling a little bit of Zoom fatigue setting in. I think everybody else probably is too. So uh, I'm very grateful um, that you have all decided to join. Um, we have, uh, we're very fortunate to have our speaker today. We are joined by uh, Ms. Tawana Honeycomb Petty. So Tawana Petty is a mother, social justice organizer, youth advocate, poet, and author. Uh, she works in water rights advocacy, data and digital privacy education, and racial justice and equity work. She was born, raised, and calls her home, Detroit, Michigan. Uh, I'm going to just give you some of uh, Tawana Petty's publications, and she herself will tell you about some of the organizations that she works with. But she is the author of Introducing, Honey Home, Introducing Honeycomb, Coming Out My Box, The Petty Propolis Reader, My Personal and Political Evolution, and Towards Humanity, Shifting the Culture of Anti-Racism Organizing. Uh, Honeycomb is also a founding member and editorial board member of Riverwise Magazine. So again, I'm just so thrilled and thankful that you could join us today. Uh, and uh, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you all so much for having me. Um, so I am going to do slides. I apologize in advance, but I'll try not to bore you. Uh, you can yell at me after if you somehow get bored. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, so I, um, I am a uh, lifelong Detroiter. I'm a mom. I have a son who is in uh, law school at UChicago Law. Um, and I am currently, I run an art organization called Petty Propolis. Uh, Propolis being the, the uh, it is like the glue that the bees create to protect the hive. Um, and it also translates to defense of the city. And so my poetry stage name is Honeycomb. So that's how I came about uh, the name of that organization. But I also am the uh, data justice director for Detroit Community Technology Project. I convene the Detroit Digital Justice Coalition. I'm an anti-racism facilitator with Detroit Equity Action Lab and a non-resident fellow with the Digital Civil Society Lab at Stanford. And so I'm gonna share my screen with you all. Um, and okay, so the name of my talk is uh, Black Narratives, Black Data, Surveillance and the Fear Economy. And so I wanna take you a bit through a bit of history about Detroit and why I chose this as um, my topic. So I wanna talk you through anti-Blackness in action from a Detroit perspective. I was born and raised in Detroit. I've been there my whole life. And for the last half century in Detroit, Detroit has had a particular dominant negative narrative. And so anywhere that I've traveled in the world my entire life, folks have had generally one perspective of Detroit. Uh, hopeless, helpless, bankrupt, violent, uh, Detroiters are not uh, good stewards of their property um, and just just a very negative uh, visceral response to uh, to, to live livelihood in Detroit. And so one of the issues that that has and the psychological impacts that that has on residents, especially young people growing up in the city, is that you internalize those things. And you're kind of taught that the only way that you can make uh, a living or be a productive citizen is if you grow up and get out of the city. And so I'm gonna take you through a bit of that narrative. So this is, um, let me see. This is a quote from an article called Smart Cities Dive. And it was asking whether or not it was time to change the narrative about Detroit because there was more investment, the demographic was shifting to more, uh, to have more white residents moving into Detroit. And folks were asking a question, you know, should we change the narrative now? Because we kind of want to, we want people to kind of want to be here. And so one of the quotes from that article is, the standard narrative for Detroit has been about a bankrupt, vacant, decaying, post-industrial wasteland, an environmental, social, and economic disaster. Detroit has been the quintessential shrinking city, the poster child for everything that has gone wrong with the post-industrial Midwest. And so these are the types of things that hover over 
uh, people who've been in Detroit, you know, for decades or born and raised here or educated in Detroit. And so you have young people growing up in the city, and this is the narrative that they're constantly hearing about where they live until very recently when they started to say Detroit is coming back. Here's another uh, article that was in 2014, uh, and the literal title of the article was based on uh, L. Brooks Patterson, a county, exe county executive in one of the richest counties in the state of Michigan. And he's really instrumental in a lot of policy that happens in Detroit because he rejects um, any kind of support for Detroit. And he kind of rallies other uh, suburban leaders to do the same. And so whether it be mass transit, um, investment in housing or any of this, the water infrastructure, which he was intricately um, invested in once they made um, a Great Lakes Water Authority and those sorts of things. So over decades, Elbrooks Patterson had a consistent impact on um, a policy that happened in Detroit and disinvestment. So here's some direct quotes um, from Elbrooks Patterson. He recently passed away. Uh, a few several months ago, but these are some of the quotes that he would uh, things he would constantly say in the media. I used to say to my kids, first of all, there's no reason for you to go to Detroit. We've got restaurants out here. They don't even have movie theaters in Detroit, not one. He went on. I he went on to say, I can't imagine finding something in Detroit that we don't have in spades here except for live sports. We don't have baseball, football. And for that, fine, get in and get out. And when the reporter asked him how might Detroit fix his financial problems, he said, I made a prediction a long time ago and it's come to pass. I said, what we're gonna do is turn Detroit into an Indian reservation where we herd all the Indians into the city, build a fence around it, and then throw in the blankets and corn. And so this is a wealthy, uh, Oakland County executive, one of the richest counties in Michigan, very instrumental at the table with making policy decisions in Michigan. And this is his perspective um, on Detroit uh, for his entirety of his uh, career, which spanned several decades. Uh, he's really instrumental in making sure that mass transit didn't happen um, into the suburbs, particularly into Oakland County. Um, and like I said, water infrastructure and other uh, policies. In 1977, there was a film called Take Him to Detroit. Well, the film was called A Fistful of Yen. And the theme, uh, the running theme of the film was Take Him to Detroit. And so what happens was there was like this evil drug lord in the film and like he's punishing all these people that he feels have defied him or, have, or done wrong to him. And he's doing very violent punishments to these folks. Um, and so he's beheading people. Uh, he's doing like very vicious crimes. And so he gets to uh, what he a CIA agent who he considered to be his most vicious uh, uh, person who uh, he wanted to punish. And when it got to the point of his punishment, he said, take him to Detroit. And, um, and the man screamed and yelled and he would rather be killed instead of being taken to Detroit. And this is a film that was very popular um, and uh, still continues to be uh, quoted today. And so what are the real life impacts of this type of persistent narrative for a near half century? Um, some of those impacts are like a looping cycle of injustice, mass surveillance, disinvestment, poverty, broken families, uh, water shutoffs. Uh, we had to fight uh, for an executive order to get water turned back on at the height of the pandemic when really one of the main things that you were supposed to do to minimize the impacts of the pandemic was to wash your hands and have good hygiene. And tens of thousands of Detroiters did not have water at the height of the pandemic. Um, gentrification, devastation. And so uh, the research that I did with our data bodies, which was a three year participatory research project across LA, Charlotte and North Carolina was with community members who were suffering uh, poverty, uh, returning citizens and unhoused populations. And they consistently talk about these systems that were lining up to integrate with one another, that were communicating 
uh, kind of like the worst predicaments in their lives and keeping them in this looping cycle of injustice. But they felt like the uh, that this, these systems were not communicating for their livelihood, that it was a constant data trail and data stream that was keeping them um, in a looping cycle of injustice. And so here are some quotes from some Detroiters that we interviewed uh, during our research. Our Data Bodies is still a program uh, initiative that continues to do trainings off of our digital defense playbook um, and do teach-ins and things like that. But during the height of the research, uh, we did interviews of almost 150 residents across three cities. And these were some of the quotes that came from them. The changes I would make would be to have data that is intentional and targeted and centering people in the middle of those decisions. So data would be created for the people and with people as opposed to on people and against people. Oh God, I don't even, yeah, I just feel like if I'm going to have a bank account, if I'm going to register my car, if I'm going to have health care, I don't even, I, I'm, I'm sort of giving up on trying to protect privacy. I mean, your face is not even your own anymore. Your face is being captured by cameras. I really believe that every button that is pushed collects something about you. I'm often concerned how my orientation will play a role in someone denying me my liberty at some point in the future. And these were all black residents uh, who were interviewed. These are particular quotes from black residents that I chose to share because it was this pervasive, ongoing, constant narrative. I feel like I'm watched. I feel like I'm not seen. I feel like information is being shared, but not to my benefit. And so what happens when you have a pervasive narrative for so many decades, when community members are feeling watched but not seen, and when crime, uh, quality of life crimes are a direct result of quality of life issues? Uh, there is investment in the fear economy, right? And so Detroit, prior to COVID-19, the median income in Detroit, this large metropolitan city with over 500,000 uh, black people, 700,000 residents, uh, median income was $29,000 per year. Since COVID-19, more than 40% of the residents have lost their jobs. And instead of major resources and investment in the city, our city has ramped up mass surveillance. And so we're under a real-time crime surveillance program called Project Greenlight, which is flashing green lights that are all around the city that uh, literally flash 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and they are monitored by law enforcement through real-time crime centers, three real-time crime centers. So if you can imagine, it's kind of like Batman in the Batcave, and there are these screens everywhere, and law enforcement watches them 24 hours a day at three different real-time crime centers. And right now, over 700 businesses have these cameras cameras and over 2,800 cameras. And these businesses are located at like rec centers, uh, public housing, um, medical facilities, gas stations, um, and, and schools. And, um, and they now have a component over the last two years of face recognition technology, which we know through many studies through MIT, NIST, and others that face recognition misidentifies darker skin tones. And so Detroit being an 80% black city, uh, it was we were bound to have misidentifications. So far, we are known in the US as the first two known cases, Robert Williams and Michael Oliver. And it's recent, recently come to light that there's potentially another black woman who has been misidentified, meaning that they were arrested and incarcerated for crimes that they didn't commit. And this is a very lucrative uh, project because private businesses pay for priority policing. And so they pay six to $7,000 a month to be prioritized as priority one when something happens at their institution. This is a map of what Project Greenlight was projected to look like when it was just 256 locations. Now, the yellow dots were the projection, uh, the green dots were ones that currently existed um, in 2016, and now this is only 256 projected. We are now at 700 locations. So you can imagine what this map looks like now. 
So here are some of the articles that I wanted to lift up around um, what the Project Greenlight program and what face, face recognition, the impact that it's having on Detroiters. And so not just in Detroit, I want to be clear that in the state of Michigan, uh, every single person who's taken a state ID since 1998 is in the face recognition database. And so no, you weren't told that when you go to the Secretary of State to take your driver's license or your state ID that it was going to be sent to Michigan State Police to put in this massive uh, database. And so what has happened is even residents who have moved out of the state in the 90s uh, or moved in the last decade could potentially be picked up for mis, uh, on a misidentification uh, for a crime that happens in the city. In addition to that, Detroit has spent over $600 million um, on cell phone tracking. So they have cell phone tracking that mirrors the towers and can intercept your phone calls. There is a uh, proposal in Michigan on the ballot proposal Two that we hope to have passed. It's a bipartisan effort that would prevent um, the extraction of cell phone and other electronic data without a warrant. And so we're hoping that that passes in November. Unfortunately, even though the police chief admitted that this software misidentifies 96% of the time and that their stopgap for that is uh, two data analysts who will catch those errors, um, Detroit City Council approved an additional $216,000 to expand those licenses just last month. And so how are Detroiters responding to this, uh, this pervasive surveillance uh, and this invasion of their civil liberties and privacy? So these are, this is just some of the articles of events that I personally uh, have either written or uh, participated in or interviewed or co-created uh, as far as R uh, Riverwise Magazine. These are just some that I've uh, participated in. There are many, many, many um, articles, uh, town halls, uh, community events that community members have participated in. They've been uh, regularly attending the Board of Police Commissioners, civilian oversight body, trying to get a ban. Um, they have been uh, on talk shows, uh, on radio programs, on podcasts, um, and that's just part of it. They've also, we've also come together with two city officials that we were able to flip their opinion on this surveillance program. They initially voted for it and now are against it. And we've come together with hundreds of residents and almost 200 uh, organizations to implement a Detroiters Bill of Rights. And so in addition to the right to safety, which would get rid of face recognition, um, militarized policing and other uh, policies in the city, we would be implementing right to be free from discrimination, a right to quality and affordable housing, a right to affordable water, a right to environmental health, a right to recreation, just places for kids to play that are safe and well lit, right to access and mobility for uh, community members with disabilities who need places, uh, you know, a viable sidewalk and infrastructure. Uh, and a right to basic needs and quality of life. And so what this is, is this is challenging the charter uh, commission to add these rights to the charter so that they can be on the ballot next year and we can make this a part of the city's constitution. In addition to that, we have started a campaign called Green Chairs, Not Green Lights. And it's really asking people to come back to the front porches to see each other, to not be watched to look out for each other and return to the things that we know create safety. If your neighbor doesn't have water, share water. If there is, if, if you see that a, a elder across the street hasn't come out of the house in a few days, knock on the door and check and see if they're okay. We're asking folks to not be relegated to individualism, to going in behind their security cameras and going in behind their privacy fences and come back to the front porches and come back to the windows and see each other again and re return the village mentality because we know that surveillance is not safety. And so listen to the young people. The young people have been going to door to door with their green chairs, not green lights, t-shirts. And they've been talking to community members about what they want in their neighborhoods. And they've been telling them that we feel most safe when we know that you're looking out for our best interests. And then finally, how can you respond? 
So challenge anti-Blackness, uh, as I mentioned to you, uh, during the pandemic, uh, the height of the pandemic, we're still very much in it, 40% uh, of the deaths from COVID-19 came out of the city of Detroit for the entire state of Michigan. More than $2,800 $1,000 tickets were issued to Detroiters for violating stay-at-home orders, which, which wasn't a law. And also, we witnessed predominantly white communities all across the globe, basically, defying stay-at-home orders, going to beaches, and just basically living their lives without being penalized with $1,000 tickets. And I also mentioned to you that their $29,000 was the pre-pandemic median income, and now almost half of the residents in the city have lost their jobs. Black people in surveillance. Under Project Greenlight, there are now over 2,800 cameras at 700 locations, and it has not created safety. It has created misidentifications. And Simone Brown, the author of Dark Matters, reminds us that this type of surveillance is tied to the 18th century lantern laws where a black person had to have a lit candle lantern in front of their face if they weren't in the presence of a white person. And so this is a long legacy of surveillance. And black children in schools, although most mass school shootings are proven to happen in white communities, black students enter through metal detectors and endure police and security guard searches every single day, even in high performing schools, even in elementary school. And a lot of times law enforcement is called on children in those schools. And so what can we do? We can challenge those dominant narratives. We can say that black people are not inherently sick. They're not dying from COVID-19 due, due to higher rates just because they weren't born uh, inherently sick because they just have bad genes. A lot of times it is inequitable treatment in the medical system. The, the neighborhoods that they're living in don't have quality air. They're living without water and in extreme poverty. And so we're asking that you inform and you resist those narratives. Surveillance ain't safety. We know what makes communities safer. Resource neighborhoods are safer inform and resist and be honest about the disparities within the school systems and call them out. And so I talk about shifting from solidarity to collaboration. And these are just some of the stages, right? And solidarity is kind of like, I understand what happened to you. I know that it's wrong. Allyship is what happened to you was wrong. And there's guilt, right? There, there tends to be this guilt and I'm gonna lean in because I feel guilty. But an accomplice is someone who's saying, hey, what happened was wrong and you tell me how to make things better. But somebody in co-liberation or collective liberation feels like their liberation is tied up in your liberation. And they want to be in lockstep to liberate themselves from systems that are harmful. And so what's the praxis? We study our history. We know more knowledge of ourselves and our ancestry. And then we actively interrupt these systems. And so one of the toolkits that I co-created with the Actionable Institute um, actionable intelligence for social policy is a toolkit for centering racial equity throughout data integration. And so anybody who's working with creating data systems, working in governmental institutions, working in any institution that is collecting data and integrating it to make decisions about humans should look at this toolkit. So what happens when we do all those things? We shift from a cycle of injustice to a path towards justice. So instead of dis disinvestment, we're looking at community investment. Instead of poverty, we're looking at equity. Instead of defaulting to surveillance, we know that evidence has taught us that well-lit streets alone create more safety. Instead of over-policing, how do we come together with our neighbors to create safety teams? And broken families can be resolved uh, to a degree with more livable wages, with affordable water, with uh, affordable housing to prevent gentrification, and viable schools that are thriving and have the resources that they need to create thriving communities. And so, and finally, I'll say, we can't stop police violence without ending police surveillance. And so these are the ways that you all can get involved right from where you are. Thank you. So I'm open for- was, I was clapping, but it was muted. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying not to, I was trying to, you know. 
Oh, I see there's there's it. claps icons coming up. So um, nice. we definitely have some time for, uh, first, uh, thank you so much for that talk. Uh, that was uh, very wonderful. Uh, so we do have time for questions. And so I invited people to type their questions or to email them to me. Okay. And then selfishly, um, I had a couple questions also. Um, so I guess I'll be rude. Can, is it okay if I ask the first question? Go ahead. Uh, I was wondering if you could just talk some more about community organizing. If you could just tell us what community organizing means for you and maybe um, for those of us who aren't familiar with that term, help us understand what a, what a community organizer is and does. Yeah, yeah. So um, I spend a lot of time um, well, now most of these things are, a lot of these things are virtual, but um, I was literally at the Board of Police Commissioners every single week um, in person, uh, which is a civilian oversight body, um, just voicing, you know, community concerns uh, to police and to the civilian oversight body, uh, engaging with the city's charter and talking about the things that we want in policy and how uh, things can be changed. Um, and as I talked about earlier, the Green Chairs Not Green Lights campaign, that is us coming together as community members and saying, we know what creates safety in our neighborhoods and organizing different initiatives. So community members are building out green chairs and they're taking them to elders and putting them on their front porches. Um, and they're teaching them about these uh, types of ways to come together and like, who are your emergency contacts if you're in a situation where you need support? And just kind of like uh, restoring like the kind of vill village mentality that keeps us in our front, looking out for our neighbors, making sure that the children go to school every day um, and get on the bus safe, just the ways that we can look out for each other that don't require really any other outside entity other than us being more humane. And so community organizing is really being passionate about the things you want to change um, in, the, in the community and coming together and creating that change or also lifting up the things that you feel good about and organizing more people to participate in that. Um, that's helpful, thank you. I have a few questions from the chat. So I'm gonna read this question from, it looks like it's from uh, Sharia from Slack. Uh, she write, Shari writes, uh, what was the motivation for Detroit to start up Project Greenlight in the first place? And as a follow-up, are there things we could be doing to try to stop these efforts before they start? Yeah, absolutely. So when Project Greenlight started in 2016, it started off at eight or nine gas stations. And those were supposed to be at gas stations that stayed open like 24 hours a day. And it was going to just be at the gas stations that stayed open late. As time went on, it became um, a mechanism for, you know, it, it became conflated with safety. And so it, it, there's basically an opportunity to have these private businesses pay into this system to not only prioritize them uh, as priority one for policing, but it was um, countering the narrative around uh, what makes us safe. And so they started to ramp them up very, very quickly. It went from, uh, as I indicated, eight or nine in 2016. And by the end of the year, it was like 174. And the following year it was 256. And now we're at over 700. And these are businesses. That's not the number of cameras. We're at over 2,800 cameras now. So it started off with like 16 cameras um, at eight or nine businesses. And now we're at 2,800. And so it's become a lucrative uh, financial contribution to the city, um, but it's also cost the city a lot of money as well because the real-time crime centers, they've spent over $30 million on those. And it doesn't create safety because crime is rapidly, uh, is, is crime is growing and quality of life is deteriorating. And so as long as we have quality of life issues, we're gonna have quality of life crime. And so one of the ways to stop it is to, you know, as we indicated, turn to one another again and look out for each other. And so once we can create a safe neighborhood and start to resource our neighbors um, and look out for each other, then there won't be a reason to put mass surveillance in our communities. And if they do it, we'll have a, you know, an argument, a defense against that uh, implementation because we'll have the data that proves that safety um, is created by community. Oh, okay, so my power just went out. Uh, we have a storm, so. Oh no. 
<laughs> Hang on. Let me see if let me see. okay, it looks like something's flashing on again. Hold on. Okay. Oh, it just did a off and on. Okay. It That's was good. also um very dramatically timed, so it gave you <laughs> a lot of emphasis. <laughs> oh my goodness, because I saw I saw things flashing behind me and then okay. Right. Well that uh, was the interesting. universe really just punctuating your <laughs> wonderful answer there. Um, right. Okay, I have another question from the chat, if that's okay. Yeah, that's okay. Okay, this question is from Cass, and Cass says, thank you so much for this talk. I was wondering if you could discuss how we can go about doing the necessary work of integrating racial equity in data analysis at the government level in light of the Trump administration's executive order banning critical race theory and race sensitivity training in the federal government. Yeah, you know, it's going to take radical courage, honestly. Um, there are, you know, some institutions here in Detroit that have been doing like study groups. Um, sometimes you can't, maybe you can't official, officially like make it a policy, but you can organize, you know, study groups, learn the toolkit, start to implement piece by piece. Um, but it has to happen. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, ve it's very complicated what is happening within the, the federal government right now. And I will say this, uh, Project Greenlight started to ramp up the right after um, Trump took off, President Trump took office. And so um, it, there was a recent article in the New York Times that talked about uh, his goals for law enforcement. And it talked about the goal of having face recognition uh, be a part of 18,000 police departments. And so these things aren't accidental. Um, and so we have to, you have to have radical courage and you have to still continue to do the work no matter who is going to be in the White House uh, because our livelihood and our liberation from these violent systems depend upon it. Mm. Um, okay, let's see. I think there's another question I have missed here. Um, I see a question from uh, Bruna, it looks like. Bruna writes, thank you for your presentation. Uh, Detroit is one of my favorite cities. Uh, I've heard of the many problems of the city that residents are facing, but I've also heard about some initiatives to bring the city, quote, there's quotes here, back. Um, but would, okay, but maybe some of them would also only bring gentrification and other problems. Would you say Detroit is moving towards a direction to achieve the Bill of Rights? Currently, are there good initiatives to address those? Yeah, so, you know, I, I probably shouldn't say this. I don't know what folks' political affiliations is, but I like being honest. Um, whenever I hear Detroit is coming back, I hear make America great again. It gives me the same kind of, you know, feeling of erasure, um, you know, that Detroit, in order for Detroit to come back and to have gotten a positive narrative is because there are more white residents moving into the city. And so that is when we start to see an influx of investment. That is when we started to hear the positive narratives in the media. Um, and so um, I think that the city is moving in the right direction. We've had city charter officials who were totally against uh, the things that we were implementing just months ago who are now willing to hear from us and um, have been listening to our committee our committee meetings for racial equity. We had city council members who were vehemently opposed to our um, call to ban face recognition who are helping spearhead the Detroiters Bill of Rights. And we have border police commissioners, civilian oversight body who unanimously voted for this surveillance who are now trying to remove the chair from the civilian oversight body because uh, he is a former law enforcement officer who is not being neutral within his decision making as a, a civilian oversight body. And so um, there are a lot of community members who are coming together with local officials and trying to get some equity, right? Um, if we can have a conversation, we can definitely, we want a working relationship with officers, uh, law enforcement, so that we can remove from the budget um, funds that are going towards militarization, mass surveillance, and, um, and have them not be going to police runs that police officers should not be going to. Um, and so that we can get the type of resources in our neighborhoods. And so a lot of people hear like defund police and they're automatically like, oh, defund police, that's you know terrible. But schools have been defunded. Water infrastructure has been defunded. Housing's been defunded. So many things within the city have been defunded. 
Um, and we're really just trying to refund those systems. And so if you look at it that way and you look at the fact that the police department has most of the budget in the city, crime has not been reduced, but quality of life has been reduced, um, then you can start to hear each other better. And so now that uh, city officials and even some law enforcement uh, are hearing with a different lens, now we can have a deeper dialogue about how we move some funds around. Um, and get the resources into the communities that they need. Because really, if you are interested in equity, you're gonna wanna see everybody survive and thrive and you don't want to live in crime. And so, um, yeah, we're seeing a lot of forward movement. And uh, the Green Chairs Not Green Lights campaign has captured the imagination of residents all over the city because it's something they can do. You know, it's something, it, it doesn't take much for you to bring your chair to your front porch and light up your, your home you know, and, and say hi to your neighbor. That's the least we can do to look out for one another. Mm. Um, so uh, Professor Piper here writes, uh, where can we find more on your framework of moving from solidarity to praxis, the opting in and acting out slide? Also, if other people want to use the little hand raise motion, we can ask questions that way too. Yeah, um, my book Towards Humanity Shifting the Culture of Anti-Racism Organizing covers a bit of that. Um, and I'm working currently working on an expanded edition, but I'm happy to send uh, that slide through um, so that you can circulate it. I'd love to hear you just talk some more about praxis. That's um, not an idea that we talk about a lot in this department. I, could you just tell us what it means to you and, and how it uh, fits into your work? Yeah, so it's essentially moving from ideology to implementation to practice. Um, and so, you know, uh, when I talk about moving from solidarity to collective liberation, uh, it is really asking uh, non-Black folks particularly to see their liberation tied up into struggling against the system of white supremacy and anti-Blackness. And it's asking us to tie into an ancestry that is connected to liberation, right? Right now in anti-racism organizing, we teach white people that they only have one history, that that history is racist, racism and violence. And we know that that white people have other histories. Um, they have other cultures that had to be um, kind of melted into a pot of whiteness so that they could be lifted up as a, a superior being. Um, and so within the moving from solidarity to praxis is asking us to look at the ancestors that were abolitionists, look at the ancestors that were anti-racist, look at the ancestors in your legacy that gives you an opportunity to look in the mirror and say, I see myself in the struggle against anti-racism and anti-Black racism. And when you can do that, it minimizes the opt-in, opt-out that happens within anti-racism organizing because it's kind of saying that is kind of their issue and when I have time, Time, I'll opt in. But really, uh, the system of white supremacy has dehumanized all of us. Um, no one is exempt from that. And the pursuit of the American dream leaves a lot of people out. Actually, most people die in pursuit of the American dream. And it's, so it's a very uh, viscerally violent uh, system to be in pursuit of like this kind of uh, hierarchy that a lot of folks are asked to live up to. Um, I talk about in my trainings a lot, the uh, white schools that have mass shootings, right? It's the very same system with the black schools that, you know, black neighborhoods where there's violence. These are kids who felt othered, who did not feel like they belong, who felt like the system did not support them and that they didn't have a village or community surrounding them. And so how can we minimize the quality of life issues that create situations where our, peop our people of all racial demographics feel like they're not being supported and nurtured and looked after? And so, yeah, so Praxis is really tapping into that legacy, that history, um, seeing ourselves connected to struggle, struggle and collectively liberating against systems that are harmful. Mm. Um, thank you. I'll, also, I wanted to thank the people who asked questions so far. Um, they've been great. There's one more question here, um, which is from David. And David writes, because police technology seems to misidentify people of color, do you think we should have less emphasis on technology in general, as Ruha Benjamin says, uh, when she recommends uh, to, quote, move slower and protect the people? Absolutely. And uh, uh, Dr. Benjamin is a comrade of mine. 
Um, yeah, so I absolutely think that. And if you don't have her book, which is up here in my slew of books on mass surveillance and policing, but uh, Race After Technology, uh, Abolitionist Tools for the New Jim Code, you have to get her book. Um, yeah, I absolutely think that we have to move slower and protect the people. Dr. King called for in 1967, a radical revolution in values, where he talked about us moving from a thing oriented society to a person oriented society and to not prioritize profit modems, machines and property rights over people. We haven't gotten there yet. Um, and that's why we can't start to value the earth the way we need to value the earth because we haven't even learned to value each other the way we need to value each other. And so we got to stop innovating for innovation's sake. We have to take a pause and ask why these things are being created. What is the impact of these systems? Um, and what does it need to exist in the world? And a lot of times there's such this rush to put a new thing out there to stall for something that we really don't hear the people who are impacted by the systems that we create. And so, yeah, that pause is very necessary. And face recognition is a perfect example of that. Mm. Well, unless there is another question, I don't see one now. Um, I definitely just want to thank you so much for coming and uh, sharing your work with us. These are a lot of questions that I think people who work uh, designing and building and studying technology want to engage with, but I think a lot of us don't maybe have the intellectual skills that we need to engage seriously with these issues. So I hope very much that you can come back another time um, and that we can sort of keep this conversation going. It's, it's, it's definitely an important conversation that our community values, but we definitely um, we need help to, to have it. Yeah, and let me just give you this toolkit really quick, if I can. Um, I'll just that. put the link in the chat, because um, I really do think that this is a, a, a awesome start. If uh, folks just want to went on at their on their own time, just uh, read, start to read that. It'll take you a long way in just thinking about racial equity, um, especially within data integrated systems or um, any any form of technology or innovation that you're engaged with. And so it'll give you that opportunity to pause and think about the impact of the innovation. Oh, that's so helpful. Thanks very much. And we'll, we'll share that within the department. Um, so I definitely want to thank you again for coming. And then I think we'll all mind clapping so that you can get your props. <laughs> from. We definitely appreciate it. And also next thank time you, you. come, um, I, I know also that you're a poet. So I think next time you come, I'll also ask you if you would share a poem with us. I won't put you on the spot today, but I think we would enjoy that oh, too. Oh, it's fine. I could do one. Oh, would you really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think that would be a great way to close out. I think we would really enjoy that. Okay. And so since I've been on the theme of Detroit, because that was what I wrote that I wanted to talk to you all about, I'll do a Detroit love poem. Is that okay? Oh, we'd love that. Thank you so much. Okay. We were supposed to turn our backs on you. Count down to your imminent demise. Dangle you by the limbs of misdeeds. They wanted us to rate you inferior plagued by deteriorating neighborhoods and a convoluted history. You were never supposed to bloom from your ashes. A lot like you have been discarded like debris deemed useless to naysayers and convictors. Yet you keep rising, clinging to vitality. You refuse to allow statistics to dictate your destiny and the media will channel your journey. And though some shall remain loyal, others will mock your tribulations. You were Coleman A. Young into maturity, both your gift and your curse. Imported from adversity, you've seen better decades, yet you thrive during the worst of them. Your best days have yet to arrive, and though some won't stick around to witness your climb or rejoice in your restoration, your destination is inevitable. You've been on the bottom much longer than most, and the bridges you'll journey won't be easy to coast, but you will make it and bring warriors with you, armed with devotion. They will defend your dignity and honor your namesake. You are Detroit, the road to progression, the mirror image of endurance, and you hold the key to taking back our democracy. Thank you all. <laughs> I should have drank some water before. <laughs> I can't believe I just I I meant to ask you I can't believe I put you on the spot like that and you did that thank you so much I can't no, believe you just got that one ready that was uh, I'm blown away by that thank you so much um yeah, so yeah welcome. I'm I'm gonna give you your snaps and also uh, claps for that wonderful thing thank you.
And then um, I'll see you. I sent you information, but uh, for a meeting with students, so we can have a little break then. So uh, before we okay. meet with students, talk. But thanks okay. everyone for coming. Uh, thank you, everybody. And thanks again for the questions and everything. Bye. Thank you so much, Tawana. That was great. Thank you. Bye.